This video is the first part of our discussion of photosynthesis, which we will define as using light energy to reduce carbon dioxide to make carbohydrate. Lots of organisms are able to photosynthesize, including not just land plants, but algae in the ocean, these large macroscopic algae. We also have microscopic unicellular algae, um, as well as cyanobacteria, shown here. And there's even uh, more primitive photosynthetic bacteria that are able to uh, be photoautotrophs. There are some other organisms that are able to use light energy to make ATP, but those are phototrophic organisms that are unable to use light energy to reduce carbon dioxide to carbohydrate. So our discussion is confined to those organisms that are photoautotrophs, meaning they use light energy to both make ATP and reduce carbon dioxide to carbohydrate. In this video, we will be talking mostly about light reactions and address two questions. First, how photosynthetic organisms are able to capture light energy that you can't do anything with that light energy unless you're able to capture it. And after they have captured light energy, how do they convert or transform light energy to chemical energy such as ATP and reducing power for use by the cell? The take-home points, we have three take-home points that I, uh, in this video. The first is that light energy is used to generate a proton gradient across a membrane for chemiosmotic ATP synthesis. This process is called photophosphorylation. And this is highly similar to oxidative phosphorylation that we discussed previously in respiration. Light energy is also used to reduce electron carriers. NADP plus is reduced to NADPH. NADP is a molecule that is nearly identical to NAD, the electron uh, carrier that we previously saw in terms of respiration the only difference is that it's NAD with an extra phosphate. So to help you remember that photosynthesis uses NADP, think about the P in NADP as standing for photosynthesis. So NADP is the photosynthetic electron carrier. Light energy is used to reduce NADP to NADPH, or N reduce, used to reduce NADP plus to NADPH. The third point is really important, that cyanobacteria invented a way to take electrons from water molecules instead of from organic molecules or inorganic donors such as sulfur. And in that once they invented this ability to take electrons from water molecules, they changed the history of life and the surface of the planet and literally took over the planet. Because what this process does as a byproduct is it releases molecular oxygen. So indeed what we're talking about is oxygenic photosynthesis. This first equation is the balanced chemical reaction for oxygenic photosynthesis. What I've done here is that you will notice there's water on both sides of the equation. And I've highlighted the oxygen molecules, or, or the oxygen atoms in water on the left side, and the oxygen atoms in oxygen gas on the right side, to indicate that actually those oxygen atoms that are released as oxygen gas through photosynthesis come from oxygen atoms in water and not from oxygen atoms in carbon dioxide. 
and this is exactly the reverse of aerobic respiration. We discussed in our video on aerobic respiration how again we can put water on both sides of the equation to denote that oxygen gas, the oxygen atoms and oxygen gas, are reduced to form water. I said that oxygenic photosynthesis was invented by cyanobacteria and this is a picture of a cyanobacterium and what I want to point out to you are these invaginations these are membrane invaginations this is the plasma membrane that's been folded in. Okay. So they're not true internal organelles, but what they do is they increase the membrane surface area. And that's important for cyanobacteria because all the photosynthetic light reactions occur in membranes. And by increasing the membrane surface area through these membrane invaginations, cyanobacteria are able to achieve higher rates of photosynthesis. Now we believe that cyano -endo cyanobacterial endosymbionts eventually evolved into chloroplasts as shown here and these membrane invaginations in once these endosymbionts evolved into chloroplasts these membrane invaginations became thylakoid membranes. So in chloroplasts we see these stacks of thylakoid membranes and these are equivalent to the membrane invaginations that we see in lots of cyanobacteria. Now the evidence that chloroplasts originated as cyanobacterial endosymbionts is very similar to the evidence that mitochondria originated through a aerobic bacterial endosymbiont. So chloroplasts have double membranes, like mitochondria. They have their own circular genomes, again like mitochondria. And their DNA sequences most closely resemble cyanobacterial DNA. So for all of these reasons, we strongly believe that cyanobacteria endosymbionts turned into chloroplasts. We can't really discuss photosynthesis without discussing light as a form of energy. Visible light is a tiny portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, which goes all the way from gamma rays to these long radio waves. And we can characterize or classify electromagnetic radiation as in terms of both the frequency and the wavelength. The frequency and the wavelength are inversely related. The higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. The longer the wavelength, um, the smaller the frequency. So invisible light is a, just a tiny slice of the electromagnetic spectrum, ranging from a little below 400 uh, nanometers in wavelength to a little above 700 nanometers in wavelength. And you go from sort of blue-violet on the uh, short wavelength to uh, a dark red on the uh, high wavelength. So blue light has higher frequency, shorter wavelength. Red light has longer wavelength, lower frequency. This equation relates the energy that's contained in packets of light or photons to nu is actually the frequency, is the frequency. So nu is the lowercase Greek letter uh, for frequency. H is Planck's constant, 
the only thing I want to point out is that according to this equation then the higher frequency or shorter wavelength light contains more energy than lower frequency longer wavelength light which means that blue light has higher energy and red light has lower energy molecules that absorb light are called pigments and what we see is that if we look at cyanobacteria other photosynthetic bacteria so both cyanobacteria and plants use a very similar chlorophyll molecule called chlorophyll A other photosynthetic bacteria you also use chlorophyll and different versions of uh, chlorophyll as you can see the chlorophyll and all photosynthetic organisms whether we're talking bacteria cyanobacteria or the chloroplasts and plants all use a very similar type of molecule chlorophyll so the chlorophyll from all these sources uh, are very similar and most certainly evolutionarily related these chlorophyll molecules, oh, um, let me go back. You'll see in these chlorophyll molecules, they all have these hydrophobic tails. Which helps them, st uh, which stabilizes them or locates them in the membrane, in the lipid bilayer membrane. So this is a diagram or an, uh, a structural model of a light harvesting complex, a light harvesting complex. A light harvesting complex is a membrane structure that consists of both proteins. So here we have polypeptide chains, a protein with these transmembrane domains. The transmembrane domains are these alpha helices that uh, are in the lipid bilayer and they're associated with lots of pigments these are chlorophylls um, and carotenes and so hundreds of chlorophyll molecules and carotene molecules are associated with proteins in a light harvesting complex which is all located in membranes We know that chlorophyll is the main molecule responsible for light absorption for photosynthesis from these kinds of experiments. One is that what's shown here is an experiment where we have extracted chlorophyll from, it could be from cyanobacteria, it could be extracted chlorophyll from leaves of land plants and we put them in a test tube and we shine light of different wavelengths so we can use a prism to separate light into its different wavelengths and use a narrow slit to permit passage of only one wavelength of light or a very narrow range of wavelengths of light so what's shown here at the top is that if we allow if we shine green light on our solution of chlorophyll molecules and look at how much light is passed through our solution of chlorophyll what we see is that most of the light that most of the green light is transmitted through the solution of chlorophyll and therefore there is very little absorption of green light because most of the green light is transmitted however if we pass blue light so here in the lower is blue light what we see is that most of the blue light is absorbed by chlorophyll very little gets through so very, there's very little transmittance very high absorption so in this top graph we're plotting absorption of light at different wavelengths okay? and what we see is that chlorophyll A absorbs in the blue 
and in the red, and so does chlorophyll B with a slightly uh, displaced, but mostly in the blue and the red. Carotenoids also extend uh, some of that absorption, but none of these molecules absorb light in the green range. Now we can do a similar experiment where instead of um, having extracted chlorophyll molecules, we can have unicellular algae. Let's say we have some sort of uh, cyanobacteria or green algae in these test tubes. And we do a similar experiment where we shine green light or blue light. And instead of measuring the amount of light that gets through, let's put in an oxygen probe and measure the amount of oxygen that's generated when we shine light of various wavelengths. So the amount of light that's generated, or the amount of oxygen that, that generated, is a direct measure of the rate of photosynthesis because photosynthesis generates oxygen. And when we do that, we generate what's called an action spectrum. That is, for the different wavelengths of light, what is the rate of oxygen generation, meaning what is the rate of photosynthesis. And what we see is that the same wavelengths that chlorophyll absorbs are the, same, are the wavelengths that generate the most photosynthetic action or cause uh, or drive uh, photosynthesis by either leaves or uh, green algae. Now, a scientist named Engelman, about 100 years ago, or almost 100 years ago, um, was able to do this experiment uh, using no technology at all, basically. Um, he used a prism to generate a rainbow, and he allowed uh, uh, this illuminated a culture of filamentous algae. And in this culture of filamentous algae, what he saw was that aerobic bacteria were attracted to those regions of the algae that were illuminated, illuminated by red light and blue light, but not so much in the regions of algae illuminated by green light. So what he deduced is that these aerobic bacteria are being attracted to the portions of this algae that are generating oxygen. And it's the portions of the algae that are being illuminated by red light or blue light that are generating oxygen. And hence, you can also deduce then that blue light and red light are best at driving photosynthesis. To get at what is actually happening in photosynthesis in terms of converting absorbed light energy to chemical energy, we need to talk about photosystems and, photo and the reaction center of a photosystem. So a photosystem consists of a complex of uh, several membrane proteins along with chlorophyll and some accessory pigments such as beta carotene. And this constitutes a reaction center. A reaction center in the membrane is surrounded by these light harvesting complexes that function as light gathering antennas. So when light hits these uh, light harvesting complexes, that light energy is transmitted to the photosystem reaction center. And it excites chlorophyll A uh, in the photosystem reaction center. And the excited chlorophyll A lose its electrons and becomes oxidized. And this is the start and the basis of transformation of light energy to chemical energy, is the oxidation of chlorophyll A by absorption of light. Oxygenic photosynthesis depends on what we call a non-cyclic photophosphorylation scheme, sometimes called a Z-scheme. And it really looks very complex and we're going to try to break it down for you. The main thing you need to concentrate on are that there are two different photosystems. Okay. And there's photosystem 1 shown here and photosystem 2 shown here. 
And we're going to start off with photosystem 2 because uh, this is the pathway of electrons through uh, these photosystems. So, as I said before, each photosystem is surrounded by these light harvesting complexes that are funneling light energy. So if we begin by looking at photosystem 2, when it, its chlorophyll becomes oxidized and loses its electrons, then the marvelous thing that cyanobacteria invented is that oxidized photosystem 2 is able to immediately regain electrons by ripping apart a water molecule. And in the process, it generates oxygen gas and protons. And this is occurring in the lumen of the thylakoid. So it's releasing protons by ripping apart water and releasing oxygen gas. The oxygen gas uh, escapes to the atmosphere, but the protons stay in the thylakoid lumen. And as you can see, uh, as more and more water molecules are ripped apart, we will accumulate more and more protons in the thylakoid lumen, which is an important consideration. Now, what about the electrons that photosystem 2 gave up? Those electrons from photosystem 2 go down a series of electron carriers. And we will consider this as simply being the electron transport chain, the photosynthetic electron transport chain. It's analogous to the electron transport chain in mitochondria in that as it's a series of oxidation reaction, reduction reactions, they're passing off electrons from one component to the next, and in the process we get pumping of protons from the chloroplast stroma to the interior of the thylakoid, the thylakoid lumen. So here it shows the pumping of a proton into the thylakoid lumen. So the electron transport chain in photosynthetic membranes pumps protons across the membrane to generate a proton gradient or to help generate a proton gradient across the membrane, just like the electron transport chain does in mitochondria. So if we follow the electrons, they go down the electron transport chain, and they come to photosystem 1. So while photosystem 2 is absorbing light energy and becoming oxidized, the same thing is happening with photosystem 1. Photosystem 1 is simultaneously also being illuminated, irradiated with light energy. Its reaction center chlorophylls become oxidized, and it gives up its electrons and reduces ferrodoxin, which is sort of an electron carrier intermediate. And ferrodoxin then reduces NADP+. Plus. Okay. This is our photosynthetic or NADP, uh, our photosynthetic electron carrier. NADP plus is our photosynthetic electron carrier. And NAD plus is reduced to NADPH. So this is exactly equivalent to NAD plus being reduced to NADH during respiration. So here is our complete electron flow from water molecules through photosystem 2 down the electron transport chain. At the end of the electron transport chain is oxidized photosystem 1. And from photosystem 1, uh, upon absorption of light energy, um, these electrons then are used ultimately to reduce NADP plus to NADPH. So in the process, we have generated an electron, or I'm sorry, a, a proton motive force across the membrane. And just like we saw with oxidative phosphorylation, in chloroplasts across the thylakoid membrane, we have an ATP synthase which is very similar to the mitochondrial ATP synthase. And just like the mitochondrial ATP synthase, the proton motive force drives ATP synthesis. So in summary then, non-cyclic electron flow generates oxygen gas, 
it generates a proton gradient across the membrane which is used to power ATP synthesis and it generates reducing power to reduce NADP plus to NADPH and this equation that I've written here at the bottom summarizes all of that. So here is an energy diagram of non-cyclic electron flow showing that light energy is used to boost electrons to higher energy states. Then we have the electron transport chain that go decreasing in energy and that is used to uh, indirectly power ATP synthesis by generating a, a proton gradient. Uh, and when the electrons arrive at photosystem 1, again light boosts them to an even higher energy level which is enough to reduce NADP plus to NADPH. Just want to uh, show you again that in this process, uh, the uh, of photosynthetic electron transport, uh, that protons are pumped into the interior of the thylakoid, and that's used to power chemiosmotic ATP synthesis. Now this is a uh, seems a little reversed from what happens in mitochondria. You recall that in mitochondria protons are pumped from the matrix into the intermembrane space. So the intermembrane space has lower pH or higher proton concentrations. In chloroplasts, the protons are being pumped into the interior of the thylakoids, so it's the interior of the thylakoids that have lower pH and higher proton concentrations. But as long as you uh, get the idea that it, it's still a proton gradient across the membrane and whichever direction it is, that proton gradient is used to power ATP synthesis. So here is our summary of non-cyclic electron flow. We have two photosystems. Okay? And I would like you to remember that these two photosystems do different things. Photosystem 2 gets its electrons from water. It's going to give its electrons to the electron transport chain. And the main products of photosystem 2 that we're interested in anyway are oxygen gas, ATP through chemiosmotic ATP synthesis. Photosystem 1 gets its electrons from the electron transport chain. It's at the end of the electron transport chain. It gives its electrons to ultimately NADP plus to make NADPH. The last thing I want to talk about in this video is a twist on this called cyclic photophosphorylation. Cyclic photophosphorylation is a property of just photosystem 1. And this is another way that photosystem 1 differs from photosystem 2. The molecule ferredoxin, so photosystem 1 gives its electrons to ferredoxin, and ferredoxin in the non-cyclic electron flow reduces NADP plus to make NADPH. But if NADPH levels are high and NADP plus levels are low, then ferredoxin can instead give its electrons back to the electron transport chain. And in the process, it generates a, it helps um, to generate a proton gradient, which makes ATP. This is a way that uh, be, uh, photosynthetic bacteria and chloroplasts have as a way of balancing electron flow between the two photosystems um, and making extra ATP um, as needed.